Welcome to the Future Humans Podcast with Gene Houston and Annalus Smitsman, the co-authors of the Future Humans Trilogy. Today we have the enormous pleasure of welcoming our very dear friend and colleague, the esteemed system scientist and world-renowned philosopher, Professor Irvin Laszlo. Um, Professor Laszlo was twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. He has published more than 101 books and over 400 articles and research papers. <clears throat> he is the founder and president of the Club of Budapest and the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research. He is a recipient of so many, many international awards, honors, a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science, member of the Hungarian Academy of Science and of the International Medici Academy, the editor of the international periodical World Future, the Journal of New Paradigm Research. He has dedicated his entire life to exploring the intersections between science and spirituality and the birth of a new paradigm in science and systems thinking based on the fundamental unity of life and the primacy, the great primacy of consciousness. I believe that what we have here in Urban Aslo, Aslo is an evolutionary event. He is a future human who comprehends not just all the past knowledge, but he is already a deeply wise inhabitant of future knowledge as well. So dear Irvin, you know, you recently published a wonderful, wonderful, fascinating book, uh, highly recommend, The Upshift, The Upshift, which is truly an essential handbook for urgent action and wiser living on our beautiful planet, the Earth. Irvin, could you please tell us, what was it that inspired you to write this book, The Upshift? And what does The Upshift mean to you? Well, Jean, first of all, I'm speechless when hearing your introduction. That's wonderful, that's far too great for me, but I, I, I just think of myself as somebody who is curious, tries to inquire, try to make the most of this lifetime and try to find out a little bit about who we are and what this world is around us and never accepting pet answers. I mean, that's really what I've been doing all along, just not really saying, yes, that must be so, just because somebody says so. But you have been doing the same, Jim, and you've had this wonderful life with the deepest spirituality, a true leader in that field. Well, what did inspire me to do this? I have a hunch that we are at a turning point. We have been talking about turning points for some time. But this really came about. We, say, we, already, we used to say that a turning point is coming. Now we can say that it has come. We have had the, the uh, virus, global crisis. We have had, we are having uh, uh, climate change, global crisis. And now we're having a war and violence global crisis. It's really, it's everything is being shaken up. I have a sense that this is not for nothing. Perhaps not entirely coincidental that the old world that we have lived in was bound to change, was bound to transform, bound to disappear as in the form that it was. And that there is a new era dawning. The old one is not sustainable. The old one is a dead end. And so I have a sense, it's, it's a hunch, it's a guess, that there is a new horizon dawning because we have to change, we have to transform, we have to transit into something else. And people are increasingly, increasingly becoming aware that something else is happening, not the same thing all over again. I have a sense that this is a historic moment, 
when the road opens up. Up by up, I mean a, a continued a continuation of the evolutionary journey that leads us upwards to our more consciousness, to our greater unity, the greater oneness. And along that line, more and more complex and coherent, uh, one, one kind of system, oneness systems, holistic systems are coming to be on Earth. The existing systems are transforming, breaking down very fast. And the new ones are coming. I have this, this seed in them, this seed for something new, for something more co core, more coherent. <clears throat> So to make it this long story short, I just have a hunch that we have to talk now positively about the way up, the way up along the evolutionary continuum. And I'm trying to document, I say this, this is giving reasons why we think that there is a historic turning point that's come to us and why that we can make use of that. We can make use of it, not just being blinded by the violence, by the aggressiveness, and by the by the climate problems, and by the refugee problems, and poverty, and all the rest, but see that all of this means a transformation. It means that what cyberneticians call the a kick, that initial kick that you give a system, and then it starts transforming or that little bit of a flapping of a wing of a butterfly, it's a friendlier metaphor than the kick, and that little, a little butterfly that flaps its wings and changes the weather on the opposite side of the earth and eventually changes, changes it on this side as well. So I have a hunch that we are at this point and I just wanted to write down my, my thoughts, like to document why I think this world is unsustainable and also say something about what we can do each one of us, each normal person can do to become a part of this upswing, upshift, this upswing, you can also say, toward a better world. I think we can all play our role. We can all do something. And I was reflecting what we could do. And I tried to put that out in a little book, a, little, a slim little book, but I tried to make it as comprehensive as possible. Thank you very, very much, uh, Irfan. And I resonate deeply with that. In fact, Jean and I, we've been writing about that upshift tipping point that you're talking about um, also as a birth point, um, as we are now entering into the birth canal. And when I was listening to you, the image that comes to my mind is that before the baby uh, is born, there's a moment where it actually needs to change its position so that the hat can engage. Um, and very good. I didn't think of that. You have to be able yeah. to think of that. But I think it's excellent. Great. It's because otherwise we were trying to get with our feet out through the birth canal, and that's not not very pleasant, not for the baby and for the mother. So we need to, right? We need to make that that shift. We need to make that that radical change. I'm just agreeing strongly. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's part of your work as well, lifetime achievement and dedication. But I've seen you do as well, and uh, you know, and I'm happy to be a member also of the, of the Laszlo Institute. Uh, is this working on this new paradigm in science as well? Because in this new paradigm of science, we've also been really providing the conditions and the, the, the breakthrough in science for this radical new understanding also of the nature of reality. And I think this is really important because if we are trying to create action for systems change from an old mechanistic understanding uh, of reality, then all we're doing is increasing the same old polarization and dualism um, that has created so many problems. Problems. So I really appreciate how in your work, really been working on this fundamental understanding uh, of life as a unified reality, the primacy of consciousness as well, but also your understanding of the Akashic fields uh, and cosmic coherence. I believe that this principle of cosmic coherence is essential for being able to attract these systems 
in these birthing uh, conditions, in this, when the pressure for system change is increasing, that the cosmic coherence is able to attract it then to these higher orders of reality. So I would be really pleased if you could share with us a little bit more about what this cosmic coherence principle, as well as the Akashic field, means, and especially for how we are applying this now as we are going through this birth canal, and we need to you know, engage to get into the right position. <laughs> well, my goodness, these are the biggest questions you can, you can ask. <laughs> it seems to me that if you draw a line, and the, the, very, la the very largest line you can possibly draw is for the universe as it evolves from the beginning. Because the big, fantastic discovery, I think it's a true discovery, is that the universe was not eternally here, not certainly in, in, in the kind of way, space-time laws that we, that we have today. That's, there was a beginning, and there is likely to be also an end, perhaps a rebirth coming, or perhaps other universes taking, taking on. But this universe is not infinite, not eternal. It has a, a, a burst canal, it has a burst, and it, it, it has an adolescence, it has an adult who's, it has an old age, and it has a rebirth, rebirth, perhaps a rebirth experience coming about. But this universe is not eternal, as far as we know. Then we can ask ourselves, what is the largest, greatest movement that we can observe in this universe from the beginning? Then it seems to me that one can sum this up by saying, from chaos to coherence. You know, if you say that, then, you know, then everything that is evolves moves toward coherence, getting past chaos, incorporating chaos, ordering chaos, making sense of it, realigning the elements of the universe so they cohere with, with each other. And the whole universe, as we keep saying in the spiritual domain, as, as Jean and you are happy saying, this whole universe is one. But there is, it is really one because it's moving toward oneness. It has always been one, but not always in manifestation. It must have been one from the very beginning, from even before it was born. It must have had a, a, a mother, a birth. I'm trying to work with this uh, metaphor that you brought up, Anna uh, uh, Yes, there it must have been a oneness in the universe before it was born. Because from the very beginning, the very first uh, developments or actions on this universe, the emergence of particles and the working together of protons and neutrons, attracting electrons and creating hydrogen atoms, and then deuterium and the other atoms and molecules and so on. From the very beginning, there was an attraction which was not purely by chance. Had it been purely by chance, we would still be back in the chaos of the early, very early universe. But there is something that's moving things toward coherence. I call it simply in systems theory, call it an attractor. But I'm quite open to thinking that on the deepest spiritual level, is a higher mind, a higher consciousness, a super consciousness at work, perfectly open to that. I want to say the very minimum, we can say, there is an attractor which moves the universe toward wholeness. That's why I call it the holotropic attractor, tropic for tropism. It's an attraction toward wholeness. And it's in the universe, and since we are part of the universe, it's in us, it's bound to be in us. I don't think we are neutral, we are not just anything goes entities, just as this is not an anything goes universe. We are all part of it, and we are all part of this tremendous wave of moving from chaos to coherence. So I feel whenever there is a major shock, as we are living now, that this attractor is at work, and then it reassembles, it reassembles at a higher level of order and coherence and to say on the subject, we have a high level of love. 
Thank you so much. You, you comprehended about 5,000 years of both scientific and theological thinking. In uh, many cultures, when they are at the point of a potential renaissance, they often are preceded by terrible breakdown, by even pandemic, as happened in the 14th and early 15th century in Europe. That then, you know, the, the, uh, the terrible plague then followed by this process of renaissance. I love the Italian word for it. Rinascita, rinascita. Deep, deep forms of rebirth and radical transformation and discovery on all levels of inquiry. Um, I, I wonder, my friend, if you would uh, could talk about this transformation at a level of civilization that we are certainly in whole system transition and all and as well as whole system breakdown leading i believe as i believe that you believe that we are on the we are in the birth canal of this new rinascita this new rebirth which will bring i believe extraordinary insight into the great workings of it all moving from chaos to coherence. Well, you are, can articulate this, Gene, better than anybody else, because you know it both rationally and intuitively. You have this deepest spiritual wisdom, which is so rare in the world, and you can combine it with your insights from science, so to, to, to say that this insight, this intuition is not imagination. It, has, it stems from the same source as true science stems. Namely, it stems from the way this whole system works, moves, evolves to higher levels of coherence, oneness, and articulation. <clears throat> You can articulate this, and this is already a spiritual, already an evolutionary phenomenon. Let me just add one more thing. You talked about civilization and climate, it's about civilization. You know, the, on the East, we have had civilization for far longer than we have had in the West. That's right. And Gandhi had this wonderful sense of humor with some truths, and he was asked, What do you think of Western civilization? He said, I think it's a good idea. I do. <laughs> How do you connect with these future human potentials in yourself? And how can others recognize them and support the, the activation and the emergence of these potentials in our world as part of this whole system transition from chaos to coherence? Gina, I think you and Anna Luz have written this trilogy, this sequence of three books, and you spell these things out brilliantly and at depth. I can't add anything. It will just be superficial compared to what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that there is this movement, there is this seed of a dynamism, of, of, an, of an evolutionary, of an unfolding, of an information of the world. There, is, there it is, it's in us, and, and that's the future. We are moving in that direction. If we don't keep doing stupid things and end up by, by becoming extinct, which is a distinct possibility, if we could just manage to keep ourselves together and keep intuiting this wisdom of the direction toward coherence, toward oneness, and we keep being guided by the love that this inspires, then I think we'll be moving toward a world that is truly a family, that is truly has a wholeness to it, that is truly a community. We have the seeds of it here. And whenever there is a real crisis, there's sometimes something is coming up, something is coming up and new ideas are coming up. Just at the current crisis, which is the Ukraine crisis, and the in unprecedented solidarity that it is calling for in the world is simply amazing. And, and uh, it's just, we really need, unfortunately, for the time being, we need a common enemy to be able to pull ourselves together. 
a common opponent, like a, somebody who is on the other side and threatens us. And then we pull together. I witnessed as a child, when I was 12 and the war came to an end in Budapest, I have witnessed the response of ordinary people to the Nazi threat when we were occupied. And when the war came to an end, I witnessed this, this fantastic sense of rejuvenation, rebirth, ya rinashita, as we had in, in Budapest. I was 12 and then 13 after then 14. I left when I was 15 in uh, Hungary. But until then I was there and I participated, even though as a, it's just as a small child, I participated in the sense that now we are building something. Now we are coming back to life from the rubble, you know, of a city that was heavily bombed, up to the rebuilding and seeing the, every time a neon light came upon our store, I, I rejoiced, I, my goodness, look at that, there's a new light over there coming up. And you can hold hands now and we can, we can, we can move forward together. It's a sense that I'll never forget. And I think that's kind of a sense is being recalled to me now in the, in the, in the so-called free world that we can be proud to belong to. <clears throat> there is a unity, there is a new coherence, there's a new agreement on what we need to do without asking too much about what is, who is getting how much. Yes, we have to do it. And there is a sense, yes, we can pull together, it's possible. And we can build out of the rubble of, that city, of those cities in, in Ukraine, we can build something better. And I think it will be coming for us in the coming years. And it will be an example of how we can build the world without having first to completely destroy it, how we can build the world from the fragments that we already have, as you are saying, and both of you, in this brilliant series of books, there is a, a new future, a future of human being born already. Thank you. I'm, I'm very grateful you shared that wisdom and that, you know, also aligns them beautifully with uh, the final question to you, um, dear Irvin. And that is when you look back at, at your life uh, and there have been so many choice points for you and we become who we are today and tomorrow also to the choices that we're making and the quality of choices we make and the consciousness uh, of that choice, which becomes really the, the seeds of our future becoming for ourselves and our world. And so for the younger generations who will be listening to this recording or watching this video, and maybe even in many years to come, and I'm thinking especially of the children, it's like I'm thinking of my own two sons, what is it for you that despite all the stupidity, as you said, we've seen in the world and the stubbornness of humans and our dualistic tendency, but then what is it beyond all of that that gives you hope for humanity, that you know, inspires you to, to tell the children that they can also trust in their humanity? What is that really for you, that seed of hope in the human heart? Well, I try to think every time I'm being asked something like this, I try to think it's true from the very beginning. What is it really? And I would say perhaps what it is really is the fact of consciousness. The fact that consciousness has appeared in us, it cannot be a, a, just an accident. It cannot be a, a sort of an epiphenomenon of something else. It has had to bud force, it has, has had to flourish, had to come to, to manifestation, to expression in us, in this species, which despite of the many stupidities, is becoming, is gaining increasing insight into the nature of this world, into the nature of reality, nature of who we are. Every time there's this discussion starting from the beginning, we don't anymore dis dismiss it and say, that's just metaphysical speculation, or they're just idle spirituality, imagination. Nowadays it's being taken more seriously. There is really something that we can find out about the world which is very different from what we thought it was. Not a passive, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a smooth and un, un, non-dynamic, uh, it's only negative things I could say about that. 
kind of a, a reality. It's a dynamic reality. It's a reality which, which is practically alive, which makes us alive, which is in us. When, as long as we live, that is in us. And it makes me think that, that we are here, that we are a conscious human being, cannot be just a chance phenomenon. There must be some reason for it. There must be a higher will, a higher volition unfolding in the world. And being part of that, being, being able even to phrase this, or pose this question, and grope for some answer, already is a tremendous achievement that we are not bound to disappear. We are capable of, of finding a little bit what is true about this world, what is real, which way is it going. And perhaps the way it's going is the way it has to go, the way it was meant to go. I know it sounds anthropocentric, and, uh, but I believe that there is, there must be, there are bound to be a higher level of will and in, intent unfolding in our consciousness, a kind of a super consciousness. But you and, and, and Gene have been writing about it, so you know it very well. I'm just trying to verbalize the, question, the answer actually to the question that you, <clears throat> you and Rose, you are the responsible for it, having asked the question. So I'm trying to grow for an answer. I have time to say, yes, the future human is being born and it's not born accidentally. It is already here, and we try to live it, we try to be it, and that, I think, is the change that Gandhi says you need to be by living it. So I think I'm hopeful, and I think this is not accidental. The holotropic attractor, the will of God, the Taoist, what Mohammed said uh, and, and wanted, but in every great religion, and you know them all, this comes to the fore. Love, oneness, developing cooperation, working together, all this is in us and let it shine forth. This is the time for it to do it. Thank you so much, Irfan, for your profound wisdom and, and your service to, to humanity and everything you've shared with us. Jean, would you like to have the closing word? <laughs> Please, Jean. Yes. I think the closing word has to be a poetic one. Because I think you, dear friend, you really are the incarnation of these words, which are the human heart can go to the lengths of God. Dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries cracks, breaks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flood, the flow, the upstart spring. Oh, thank God, our time is now when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul folk ever took. Affairs are now soul-sized. The enterprise is exploration into God. What are you making for? It takes so many thousand years to wake. But will you wait? For pity's sake. Oh, dear, dear Irvin, you are one who has awakened and continues to cause so many people and institutions to wake up. You have not bored God. Thank you, dear friend.